This is the oral history interview project through the Seymour Library and the Cayuga Museum in collaboration with the New York Heritage Site. This is Alexis Rivers interviewing Lithgow Osborne on July 30th, 2020. So where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in the late 50s, in 1959 in Auburn, New York. Can you tell me a little bit about your family, what your parents did for a living, any siblings, things like that? Um, my father was the publisher, well, he was the editor and eventually the publisher of the Citizen Advertiser in Auburn, New York. And my mother worked for the newspaper. Um, she was also involved in a number of um, uh, community groups. Uh, she was in the Auburn Housing Authority and she was also on uh, the Democratic Committee in Auburn. And uh, my father eventually sold the newspaper um, and focused his primary attention on the um, on cable vision, which was the local cable system. Um, Cable vision at that time was a relatively new concept, and he was um, involved in bringing cable vision to um, to Auburn and to Central New York. Do you have any siblings? Um, I have six brothers and sisters. Um, they we all grew up in Auburn, and they live. Um, various parts of the country, but primarily the Northeast. Um, I have three sisters and three brothers, and um, they are involved primarily education and the law. Um, my younger brother is involved in the cable industry. Can you recall any family traditions that you had growing up? Um, family traditions primarily were focused on family events, uh, such as, um, you know, dinners with my grandparents who lived on South Street, um, <clears throat> or going out to Owasco, our house out on Owasco Lake on the weekends, or swimming at the Y. Um, uh, but that was, you know, we're just doing things as a family. I mean, when you have uh, seven children, it's not really terribly, um, it's not really easy to sort of say, oh, well, let's go to, you know, Emerson Park or whatnot, because it, it, it involved really corralling um, a herd of feral cats. And um, my mother's um, primary preoccupation in my childhood was um, getting the maximum, um, you know, the, making the least effort for the maximum effect um, because she was um, busy all the time. So, uh, corralling all of us to go and do something in particular was kind of a, a chore. But um, so there weren't um, a whole lot of specific family traditions other than doing things with the family. Um, so, With so many children, brothers, sisters, what was your house like growing up? Oh, um, well, it was never a dull moment, I can tell you that. Um, there was always, um, I mean, there was, you know, there was always a bit of, um, uh, I don't want to say drama because that overstates it, but um, somebody was always mad at somebody else or somebody was always doing something that somebody else didn't like. And, you know, so, um, there, you know, there was never sort of peace and serenity at home. Um, 
However, what I will say is that you never lacked for companionship and, you know, um, my siblings and I always did things together in the backyard or in the barn or, um, you know, walking down to Grant's or to um, uh, up to Osborne Park, you know, things like that. So there were always, there was a lot, there was plenty of companionship. Um, and so you, I learned very early on how to be one of, part of a group, but also to find ways to push myself out of the group to be um, recognized. And uh, because when you're one of seven, um, you know, you need to find ways to be recognized by your parents other than bad behavior, um, because it's, um, it's not a, uh, I mean, that, that was never a recipe for success in our family. What was the neighborhood like growing up? Well, it was Grover Street, so it wasn't far from downtown. So we could walk to, you know, um, the movies um, or, when the mall was, when they, you know, the, the mall across from um, the city hall, when that was built, um, we could walk there. Uh, Radio Shack was a particular favorite of all of us um, because, well, I mean, electronics were something that, you know, were deeply fascinating to us. Um, all, uh, Grover Street itself was, uh, you know, it's it's an older neighborhood, so there are a lot of historic homes there, and um, and that just seemed very natural to me. There, I don't think there's one newer home there. Most of the homes were built in the um, in the 19th century, uh, mid to the late 19th century. Uh, our house was built, I think, in 1920s, uh, 1820s. Um, as was the house next door, which was lived in by the Waits. Um, and they owned a department store in, um, in Auburn. Um, there is, you know, there, there's talk, you know, there was always, um, it was always said that Brigham Young worked on our house. And I don't know that there's any real um, proof of that. Uh, I know that he was in the area at the time that the house was built, but no one's, no one can verify that. Um, I will say that um, Captain Muir, who built our house, um, was a, uh, you know, was sociable fellow, and um, he uh, would host, you know, gatherings. And apparently my uh, ancestor, uh, Martha Coffin Wright, was at a party at um, our house, the house that I grew up in, um, as a guest of Captain Muir. And it was there that the, um, it was overheard somebody describing her and saying, oh, there's Martha Wright. She's a very dangerous woman. And presumably that was because she advocated for women's rights and for the abolition of slavery. Did your family follow any particular religion growing up? And do you still follow it today? Uh, yes. Uh, we, uh, my mother was an Episcopalian. Um, and. Uh, she comes from um, a professional Christian family. There are a number of Episcopal priests and um, bishops in her family. Uh, my father's family were Quaker and Unitarian. Um, I'm not quite sure when he became an Episcopalian um, per se, but I know that we always went to St. Peter's as, you know, growing up. And um, that's the tradition that we grew up in. And I still am, you know, I'm still an Episcopalian. I go to church. 
uh, not now, of course, but um, when I was allowed to go, I, you know, certainly went every Sunday. Um, but I w am referred to by others as a cradle Episcopalian because there are a number of Episcopalians who are um, refugees from other Christian um, denominations. And um, so. What was school like for you growing up? Did you have any sort of hobbies or special interests as a child? Was there anything popular? Not necessarily social media per se, but like books, toys, games, things right. all the kids wanted to have. Well, I mean, uh, I went to school at uh, Seward School and um, and of course, we walked there uh, because we were just under the mile marker, so we couldn't get a bus to school. Not that that was really any kind of a hardship for me particularly because, uh, and for my siblings. I mean, I think we all enjoyed, um, for the most part, the walk to school because um, we enjoyed the exercise. And, um, you know, all of us were very curious, outgoing kids. So. The idea of walking from, you know, our house on Grover Street over to Seward School or where, I guess, I'm not even sure if Seward School still stands, but um, it was, you know, you ran into, you know, some of the characters who lived on the, you know, the various houses that you would walk by. And uh, there was Aunt Mary's grocery store, which was always good for candy. Um, and, you know, you'd walk with your, you know, you'd see your friends and then walk with them. And sometimes we'd ride our bikes and get in trouble for, you know, being um, daredevils on the uh, playground with our bikes by Mrs. McCargo, who was the um, principal at uh, Seward. Um, but I would say that it's fairly standard stuff in terms of the the games and everything. The only thing I can remember um, that anybody ever wanted, um, well, it was Major Matt Mason was a, a, a thing, but that may have been a little bit later. Um, so I, you know, this was during the 60s that I went to Seward School and, um, it was, you know, fairly, um, you know, we never felt unsafe or we never felt like, oh, we shouldn't um, do, you know, go this way or that way. Um, I mean, we didn't walk down Osborne Street um, because that was out of our way. Um, and we didn't walk, I can't even remember the name, some of the streets, but um, we always walked, we always kept the same path every time. We didn't mix it up at all. And um, so, you know, getting home was always, um, uh, you know, it was always great to get home because my parents always had lots and lots of books. We had a library that was filled with books. And, you know, of course we were allowed to read whatever we wanted. Um, there was never, um, you know, oh, you can't read that or don't read that. Um, we had the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I always liked. And we got magazines, which some of which I liked and some of which I didn't. Because um, my father and my grandfather worked at the paper, of course, reading the paper every day was um, considered very important, but only after my mother read it. Um, you know, she would read it and then we were allowed to, to read it. And um, so, you know, we all developed um, the notion that understanding the world around us was, you know, it was extremely important. Um, the greater world not just Auburn or Cougar County or New York State, but, you know, the United States and the world. And um, so that was fun. And I had a collection of toys and books and things that I would play with in my room. Um, 
you know, either with my brother or my younger sister. Um, my younger brother and my younger sister were really my close companions as, as a child. Um, and I was very close to both of them and I'm still close to both of them. Um, and I, my four older brothers and sisters were, um, uh, you know, I was not as close to growing up because we were always separated, um, you know, the three youngest and the four oldest, because it was a way to organize us into a smaller groups in order to, you know, they're more manageable. Um, and so that always, um, you know, that just seemed to, to work better for my mother. And, um, you know, because she was really the one who, you know, carried the burden of managing all of us, that it, um, you know, so what worked for her worked for all of us. Did you have any uh, jobs growing up, either chores within the household or a job that, you know, paid the bills type of thing? Well, yes. Um, we were obviously expected to clean up our rooms um, and keep them neat and tidy. Um, and if we couldn't manage that, we were um, expected to keep the door shut. Um, again, my mother, you know, it was a battle of attrition. So my mother was, um, you know, she was not going to stand there and watch you clean up your room. So if you weren't going to clean up your room, then you needed to keep the door closed, which made sense. But I was somewhat of a fastidious little boy. So I, um, you know, my room was always, for the most part, neat and tidy. Um, we did our own laundry because um, there was too much laundry. Um, and my mother, um, you know, just decided at some point that she didn't want to, to be responsible for it all. Um, so we all did um, our own laundry and we learned how to do our own laundry early on. And then there were, um, you know, taking out the trash, um, emptying waste paper baskets, clearing the table, um, filling the dishwasher, um, and, you know, things like that, uh, straightening up the sunroom, that, you know, things like that. Um, and then when it came time to, um, we had all been um, uh, involved in the Auburn Children's Theater, um, which Sue Ryford had started. Um, and I think it was in the mid 60s, but I could be wrong about that. But she started the Auburn Children's Theater and we spent many Saturdays there and some nights uh, during the week there as well, um, during rehearsals for shows and whatnot. And at one point she um, got permission to take over the merry go -round Theater up at Emerson Park, and she turned it into um, a summer stock. And so, Every single one of my siblings and I worked at Auburn, um, well then it became Auburn Civic Theater. And um, we worked there in various jobs. Um, curiously, none of us ever became performers, but all of us worked backstage. You know, I did costumes and helped build some sets. And, um, you know, my brother, my older brothers worked on uh, building sets and my, um, uh, my sisters all did various things, I mean, props and um, stage managing and things like that. So, and, and that was, it was fun to work there because, you know, while it was not a really, um, by no means profitable, it was fun to have a little bit of spending money. So. And you went to college. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. Well, I, um, I, before I went to college, I was sent off to boarding school at the age of um, 12. I went to uh, boarding school in Connecticut and then, an, uh, then for two years, and then I went to another one for two years in, um, also in Connecticut. 
Um, and I think that, um, you know, I had dyslexia, I have dyslexia. So my mother felt that the focus in the smaller classroom would allow me to, um, you know, have a better advantage in terms of um, my studies and, you know, succeeding with my um, schoolwork. Um, I took a year off between um, graduating from school and going to college, and I worked at Auburn Civic Theater as a costumer and um, built their, um, they had a program uh, which I ran, I built it and ran it, which was um, renting out costumes to um, people who were, you know, wanted costumes for one thing or another, because at that point they had quite a costume library and, um, and it was in a, in a bit of a disarray. So I organized it and um, began that whole process of renting it as well as doing the costumes for the plays that they did during the year. Um, I went to Sarah Lawrence, which was in uh, Bronxville, and I was there for, um, uh, I graduated in 1983, yes, 83. Um, and while I was, and I studied writing and um, history while I was at Sarah Lawrence, I also did some theater, but not really a lot. And uh, while I was at Sarah Lawrence, I um, decided to move into Manhattan and I lived in New York while going to Sarah Lawrence. Do you think that Auburn and Cuga County has changed at all, either for better or worse, since you grew up? Well, I mean, all of us like to think of our childhood as being, you know, um, perfect and wonderful and marvelous, uh, maybe. I mean, um, I certainly felt very safe and protected and, um, uh, and, you know, the problems of unemployment or diminishing population or lack of opportunities um, or any kind of um, racial tensions were not really at the forefront of my, um, my thinking at the time. Although, you know, um, there were a number of um, older buildings that were torn down and um, what exists now in, as Auburn was, you know, when I was growing up, it was significantly different. There were, there were a lot more um, um, historic buildings in downtown Auburn and a number of them sadly were torn down um, in the uh, in the opportunities that presented themselves uh, via urban renewal. And the mayor at the time was very keen on getting that money from the federal government in order to, um, you know, infuse a certain amount of um, um, cash and prosperity and, you know, bring money to Auburn to help it, um, you know, help it grow, presumably, but also to modernize and to compete with other towns of the like size. I don't know that it was entirely successful as a program because we lost a lot of the, what would be considered the, the you know, the spirit and the, you know, the feeling, the historic feeling of Auburn. Um, but at the time, it seemed like a good idea. I mean, it's why we have the, the loop that goes around um, Auburn today and why the, um, you know, the arterial goes through um, that northern, you know, or, yeah, the northern part of town. Um, and, you know, decisions were made for a very specific reason. Um, I mean, I obviously was not at the table, but it's an, you know, my, my perspective is purely hindsight. 
Um, so yes, I would say that Auburn has changed tremendously, but you know, with every change comes opportunity. And um, I see Auburn um, now embracing those opportunities. And while Auburn does not have nearly the wealth that it used to have, because there used to be a number of very wealthy people in Auburn, um, there are local people who are committed to real substantial change. And to me, that is inspiring. That is, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, thing to see. Um, the Gay Pride event that happened last summer, not this past summer, but not, yeah, last summer, um, was fantastic because I think that there are young people who grew up in Auburn who didn't necessarily see themselves when they went out when they when they went out into Auburn they um, perhaps maybe they felt like they were alone and that there was nobody like them and I you know LGBTQ kids um, who um, maybe might have thought that they did not fit in, that they didn't belong there. And as a gay man who grew up in Auburn, um, I myself never, I never felt um, disenfranchised because, you know, my last name is Osborne and I don't, uh, you know, there's a statue of my great grandfather in front of the police station. There's a street named after my, you know, one of, you know, my ancestor. You know, the, the, the Osborne Harvesting Works employed half the town at one point. The, um, you know, the city hall was a gift of my, of, you know, family members. So I never felt disenfranchised ever. I always felt like Auburn was my, hometown. It is my hometown. It's where I'm from. But not every LGBTQ kid has that feeling or that, um, you know, that sense of belonging. Um, and, you know, I also come from an extraordinary family that would never have ever said, you aren't worthy or you shouldn't be that way or, um, you need to change yourself or I don't love you because you are who you are. I never ever got that ever. And um, I know that that's not the reality for a lot of young people. And to me, that's part of the reason um, why it's so important to have things like the Q Center and to have gay pride events or just pride events. Um, where people can come together, allies and members of the community, together to say, we want something better. We see a vision of something greater. Of, you know, um, we can change. We can change what happens here. And with the history that is so prevalent in Auburn, I mean, we are, Auburn is a, is, uh, an amazing place because so much history has happened there. I mean, William Seward, um, Harriet Tubman, the um, uh, my great grandfather's work in prison reform began in Auburn. I mean, it and you know the list goes on. But it's it's important that we need to embrace the past, but we also need to look to the future. We need to offer um, change, the possibility of change and restoration and growth, um, because it, it's the only way that we'll survive as, as a community, as a, as a town. Um, because it's not, um, if you leave it fallow, if you leave it unnurtured and untended to, it will die. Um, I don't believe that Auburn will die, but I think that there are great possibilities there. We are the, you know, we are central New York. We are located in the very center of New York State. Um, and 
Auburn is so beautiful. Every, you know, you drive around on, in, uh, you know, Cuca County and you visit the lake and you go to Skinny Atlas or you go to um, Moravia or Ithaca or um, at Union Springs and, you know, or go north to Sodus. You know, I mean, it is just fan Weedsport. It's, there are so many beautiful places to go to that you just can't believe that it's all within driving distance of Auburn, so. You mentioned significant things such as William Seward and Harriet Tubman and civil rights, things like that, but do you think that there's anything missing from the published histories of Cuca County? One of the curious um, things that I discovered, um, there was a case of um, an, um, a black fellow named uh, William Freeman uh, in Auburn. And William Freeman was the first case um, where his lawyer, uh, William Seward, our, and, my, and my ancestor, David Wright, um, argued that William Freeman was not guilty by reason of insanity or mental defect. And he was um, charged with murder. Now, I don't think anybody doubted that he, in fact, that this William Freeman had, in fact, murdered the people that he had murdered. But the point was, is that they were arguing that he um, wasn't responsible because he had been beaten so many times as a child and when he was incarcerated for other lesser crimes in Auburn prison, he was beaten and therefore his mind, which later proved to be accurate when they did an autopsy on him, that they proved that he was of a diminished capacity, that he did not fully understand what he was doing at the time. Now, what's significant there is a, the, the idea of diminished capacity, um, whereas a mentally, um, a, you know, a person of diminished mental faculties is not fully responsible and should not be punished with the ultimate punishment, but should be, you know, um, yes, incarcerated in a manner of speaking, but to a place that's more, um, you know, that, that looks after the fact that, that they cannot care for themselves, that they're not really fully responsible. And second of all, William Freeman was, was the grandson, I believe, of, a, uh, of a, an African-American um, who accompanied John Hardenberg, who was the founder of Auburn, um, and John Hardenberg brought William Freeman's grandfather, if that's in fact, I think it's his grandfather, brought him with him to Auburn um, and essentially said to him, well, this is where I'm gonna build my mill. And so I'm gonna go back to wherever he came from. He left Freeman there Freeman built the mill and cleared the land and essentially cleared the spot in order to create the opportunity for Hardenberg. So when you go back and look at it, in fact, Auburn was built on the backs of an African-American. And so I think that's something that we need to start you know, really diving deeper into and recognizing that the, that, um, that African Americans have um, a real, you know, place in the history of Auburn, because it is the, through the labor, particularly of Freeman, and I'm sure others, and you know, once we start diving deep, um, that that their um, that their contribution 
whether enslaved or not, I could not say because I honestly don't know uh, what the status of Freeman was when he had accompanied Hardenberg. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say whether I know or not because I don't. But the fact remains that it was African American labor that helped set Auburn on its path. And that should be acknowledged. And we should be um, really looking to uh, um, acknowledge that and to, I don't know that celebrating, you know, any kind of, um, I mean, if it's slavery, I don't know that we can celebrate it, but we can at least acknowledge it. And um, right now I, I, I'm, I sound a little confused, but that's because I don't know all the facts, but I do know that uh, Hardenberg was accompanied by an African-American who was um, believe the grandfather of William Freeman. So, and, the, and I believe that there are still Freemans in Auburn today. So that needs to be recognized. Obviously we're all living through the pandemic currently. Yes. And we can talk about that as well. But were there any other significant world events that you've lived through and how did they change your life? Um, world um, events? Well, I remember Watergate very clearly and that was a huge shift. Um, and before that, I remember the assassination vaguely of President Kennedy and, uh, and of course, Robert Kennedy and then Mount Martin Luther King. And, um, you know, my family was always very clear um, growing up, um, you know, there were always um, rifles in our house because uh, my father, um, you know, was a hunter as was my grandfather. And they also did a lot of um, target shooting. Um, but the guns were always locked up and, you know, there was always a huge respect for the, um, for firearms and, um, you know, there, there was not any kind of cavalier attitude about guns. Um, and after the events of, um, you know, the Kennedy assassinations and Martin Luther King's assassination, um, they, my, both my parents, um, my father less so because he was more, um, he was the editor of the paper. So having a public opinion about anything was naturally anathema to him. But my mother, on the other hand, had very strong opinions about, um, about uh, guns and she hated them. She hated having them in the house. Um, she believed in the Second Amendment. However, she thought that there was a huge responsibility on gun ownership and, um, and you know, how you handled a weapon. And, um, and we weren't really even allowed to have toy guns as children. And when we did, we weren't allowed to point them at one another um, because that was considered, you know, just not the thing to do um, because it, it sort of, um, reflected the greater events of the time. And, you know, it, the idea being, if you could point a toy gun at somebody, you could also point a real gun at them as well. So it's, you know, it's sort of um, modeling behavior that you want to see. Um, of course, I remember the lunar landing. I was not in Auburn, I was um, out West, but we watched it on television. I remember that quite clearly. And of course, Watergate was a huge, um, uh, issue at the time. Um, the paper covered it extensively and we talked about that event around the, um, the dining room table and we watched on television. I watched the Vietnam War on television, surprisingly. Um, you know, both my grandfather and my father were very, very keen on making sure that um, we were all, you know, that, that it was made clear to us just how terrible this war was and what a disaster it was. Um, and I think that, 
you know, Nixon's resignation and, um, you know, that was, that was huge. I mean, that was, um, um, you know, that the president would resign because he had broken the law was, was remarkable. Um, and, uh, but after that, I, th I think, you know, the various other uh, national um, events, you know, there was a energy crisis, of course, but, you know, I was away at school, so those things impacted me very little. Um, although I did get the paper sent to me, um, my um, my mother made sure that the paper was, you know, mailed to us, you know, when we were away. And um, so, you know, in my mailbox, a couple of days later would be the paper. And um, I, um, you know, so I could keep up with what was going on in Auburn. Um, I would say that the next big national crisis that I remember was um, the Iran um the, uh, you know, the hostages being taken um, in Iran and the ultimate resolution of that. Um, my um, family knew a number of the people, you know, one of the people who um, was um, taken hostage, so we were quite concerned about him. And then my, um, you know, then the, of course, the election of uh, Reagan, which um, did not seem like such a great idea because um, although he had been governor of California, um, it was, it seemed counterintuitive at the time and um, not really um, was, you know, I mean, I think there was a lot of concern and you know at the time that he was not really going to be um a president for all americans just the ones who voted for him and um and that did prove to be true and unfortunately he was um president when the aids crisis hit and um there was a failure of leadership on the part of the um administration in uh, handling that um, that crisis, and untold numbers of people died as a result of um, the inability of the federal government to express even concern or put any kind of effort behind um, looking for a cure or even understanding the 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 pathology of the um, of the disease and um, you know, and really um, demonizing people who um, had AIDS or who became HIV positive. Primarily, of course, it was a gay men's disease. So very easy to push that off and say, well, it's just gay men who are getting it. Well, who cares? And, um, and the, you know, that was very scary to me. But at the same time, I... Um, I am my mother and father's son. So rather than just be terrorized, I learned, um, I started learning as much as I could about HIV and AIDS and, um, uh, you know, worked for one of the first organizations that helped raise funds for, um, to um, uh, pay for studies. Uh, it was called AMFAR. American Foundation for AIDS Research, and I was the very first person to do a um, fundraiser at the college level to raise money for AMFAR. Um, and, you know, so I became active rather than being pushed into the closet or further into the closet. I was never really in the closet. So um, to um, uh, I did what I knew that I could do, which was learn what the disease was and then promote education and um, look for reasonable um, health and safety standards um, to prevent the spread of it.
And, um, you know, a lot of people were not interested in it, but I have to say that um, I, along with many, many, many others, I was but a small cog in a very large machine that helped bring about some understanding and some real um, progress. But I'm glad that I, um, you know, when I was asked, when it was presented to me, I stepped up and um, because I certainly, uh, I was afraid, but I was not, you know, I was not going to be daunted, as it were. Thank you again for being part of the project. Thank you. And um, good luck with the rest of the project. 